What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the God Logic Project. I'm your host, Avery Austin, and we have a special uh, discussion going on here. We have Radar Apologetics here, uh, Rabbi Eduardo, and we have David Costello, who are who is going to be engaging in on a debate on the oral law. And so I would love to let the brothers up here introduce themselves, say where they're from, what they're about, what they represent, and we can get into this. So uh, uh, since Radar Apologetics, you've been here before, I'll let you go last. David Costello, you're new to the channel. So I am new. Yourself. <laughs> so uh, I'm David Costello. Uh, we, Me and my wife, we run uh, Havis Center Ministries together. Um, the idea of that is to reach out to... Um, Messianics about observance of the oral law and Torah uh, and Jewish tradition and to reach out to Orthodox uh, about the truth that Yeshua is Messiah. So uh, we're kind of on the same side. Uh, we believe that Yeshua is Messiah. That's something that we hold in common. So we begin as brothers. Hopefully we leave as brothers. But uh, we're based in Chicago and um, we have um, that's what we do. We reach out to, to Messianics and to Orthodox. So we have mm. a little bit of both. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. And then we have Rabbi Eduardo from Radar Apologetics. What's going on, my brother? What is up, my brother? So my name is Messianic Rabbi Eduardo from Radar Apologetics. I run a YouTube channel called Radar Apologetics, presenting apologetics. Um, I serve as an associate rabbi of a Messianic synagogue in Bethlehem, PA. Um, if you want to find my channel, it's just called Radar Apologetics. And so, the, I, of course, we can always be um, friendly and respectful, but, you know, truth's on the line, and this isn't a war, right? I mean, I think it could be a friendly dialogue, seeking out the truth. Um, very, very respectful. And that's what I'm going into this, trying to um, come out with that, sa that, same, that same energy, that we're going to go in peaceful, work it out, talk these things out, and hopefully we come to a closer, um, closer to the proximity of truth. Amen. Amen. All right. And with that being said, guys, you knew, you're familiar with our guests today. And so uh, now we're about to just get into it on whether or not uh, the oral law is, is applicable, is relevant, really. Um, yeah. So who do we have that's going first here today? So David's going first, but I think we got to really stress what the title is, though, because the mm -hmm. title is pretty important. The phrasing of it. Yeah. So. Um, so the title is, Are Messianic Jews Obligated to Orthodox Halakha by the Lord? Mm -hmm. So um, or, Halakha is just Jewish law, and are Messianic Jews obligated to it, to keep Orthodox Halakha by the Lord? All right. So I think that that's pretty clear, guys. So let's go ahead and get this going. Are Messianic Jews um, obligated to observe the oral law? David, it's on you. I'll set your timer. Um, and as soon as you you begin, the timer starts. Okay, so I'll begin. Um, my case is that um, Messianic Jews are obligated um, by Hashem, by God, to the to follow the oral law as passed down by the sages. Um, I have a few different points and reasons for that. Uh, my first being is there is first we have to define sort of what oral law is. Um, a good example of what to use for what oral law is, is it's sort of like case law. Um, if you have the written Torah being the constitution and you have the oral law being sort of the case law, the precedents that came out through the Supreme Court. And so that's a good way to sort of frame the discussion about what the oral law is, how it functions and what its purpose is. So it's all based upon the idea of the, uh, of, of the written law, the Torah, uh, is given in the first five books of Moses. So that's really important is to get those those definitions down of what the oral law is. The oral law pretty much tells us how we're supposed to live um, live our lives as Jews, right? So we, me and uh, Rabbi Eduardo agreed that we're going to talk only as regards to Messianic Jews. We're not going to get in discussions about anything outside of that. So I also want to set down that down as well, um, where you're talking about Messianic Jews. Uh, specifically. And uh, so they should follow the oral law uh, as the case law, as the interpretations of the law as they've gone through. Um, one of the big reasons that I've sort of taken this, and I think it's a good argument for keeping uh, the laws, when we come to scripture, we should always follow biblical hermeneutic. Um, so when I went to summer night, we had biblical hermeneutic book. And the biblical hermeneutic book said that we need to interpret scripture based upon its context, based upon its genre, 
um, and also upon a logical historical approach to scripture as well. And so this is really the fundamental one that I think really gets to the heart of oral law. The logical historical approach, according to Christian hermeneutic, is the idea of we should understand the scripture as it was intended to be expressed by the writer and as it was understood by the hearers. And so we have a few examples of why the oral law and how the oral law is understood at the time of, uh, of its writing and of its hearing. And so there was no, um, there was no books of the, of the founding fathers of the church. Um, they were simply dealing with what they had at hand and what they had at hand was Pharisaic law. We have a couple of examples in Acts chapter 28 uh, in Acts chapter 21, where Paul himself says, even at the end of his life, that he follows the customs. He did nothing against the customs of our forefathers, referring to the Jewish forefathers and the Pharisees. He is keeping it there as well. We also see Yeshua. He's engaging uh, with, um, with inside of Orthodox uh, Halakha, and he's engaging uh, within the oral tradition itself, he seems to have an understanding. There seems to be no, no dispute at all between uh, the actual functioning of the oral law. In fact, in uh, the picking of the grain in Matthew chapter 12, he uses a, uh, uh, a halakhic principle called miyad v'yad uh, be'ocho, which means in your hand immediately uh, you're allowed to eat. And so there uh, this is a principle through which um, I now use it to uh, un, uh, take apart eggs or unshell eggs when I eat them on Shabbat. So this is a principle that exists. Um, his healings also are really no problem. There is uh, modern halakha, but halakha even of his day held that healing was permissible as long as it was done uh, meeting certain requirements for certain things. I have a, a video on my page about that as well. Um there is also, I want to get into a little bit of what uh, the Torah law coming from Mount Sinai means, because this was a little bit of a discussion as well. Uh, the Rambam in his Hakdama to the Mishnah, he lays out what is a actual law that is a halakha from Sinai. And a law that is a halakha from Sinai is something that is not hinted at or not explained in the Torah, but is simply passed down. There are five distinctions of these. Uh, there, are, are there are other halakhas that follow out from it. Uh, some of them deal with reason. Some of them deal with uh, a little bit of a, a sage that has passed it down, but we see all these being used. Um, we also see in scripture, um, we see Midrash being quoted and even used as scripture. We see that in Jude 1.9. We see him following, I have a few notes, just give me a second to take a look at them. Um, we also see in Hag uh, Hag Haggai uh, 221, where there are things that are not written in the law of Moses, which are understood as halakha. Jeremiah 17, 19. Um, there are rabbinic and Pharisaic understandings there as well. Um, but we also do see them uh, uh, in, the, in the Gospels and in the um, writings of Paul as well. In John 1, 14 to 24 to 26, in fact, Jesus is called a, a Pharisee. Uh, in Acts, uh, Paul him, calls himself a Pharisee as well. Uh, and so therefore, there is no reason that I think that we should have any reason to go apart from what is found in Scripture. The departure from, uh, from oral law uh, seems to be simply from the church fathers, which comes after scripture. Um, we find in Acts 16 too, even Paul, who is used a lot of times have those kind uh, those kinds of discussions. In Acts 16 too, he circumcises Timothy because he follows matrilineal descent. Um, there is also a good idea, and this is the last sort of section that I want to get into. Um, there are believers in Yeshua who in fact, uh, were a part of the establishment of what we commonly know as the, the Talmud and oral law. Um, in Sefer Hasidim, Shimon Ke Kepha is called a Zadik. In Hulan 84a and Megillah 23a and Avoda 17a, um, there is Yaakov Amina and Yaakov Shekhania, which are both considered uh, followers of Yeshua, and they actually are treated favorably in two out of those three situations in the Talmud itself. Um, it is also in Mox or Vitri in uh, Jewish tradition that 
Shemin Kefa, Peter wrote Nishma Bakol, which is a prayer that we say in our prayer books as well. Um, in Acts chapter 3, they're following and going up and performing sacrifices and also doing Minka prayers. Uh, so there, to me, seems to be no reason why in Scripture, if we're dealing with Scripture, uh, why there should be any reason to not follow the followings of uh, John and Paul and uh, Yeshua himself, who uh, submit to um, who submit to the rulings of the oral law and follow them. So, do I still have a few minutes? <laughs> oh wow, I finished faster than I thought. Um, there's a few other uh, sort of examples of this. Nicodemus comes up in the Talmud himself. Um, a follower of Yeshua is brought up in John chapter three and Baba Bavra sixty six. It actually says that being born again is an idea. Uh, that comes about in Bava Bava 66 as well. And he's also mentioned in Kasuvas 104, Kasuvas 67, Kasuvas, Kasuvas 66. And he's a follower of Yeshua and he is considered a sage uh, and a primary person involved in establishing the uh, the oral law. Uh, and he's very important in the establishment of it in Yavna and, and onwards. So that's my opening case. Um, as well. Yeah. All right. You, you didn't want to sneak in a few jabs in there because you got a minute and 45 seconds. You know, you can I have a minute and 45 seconds. Yeah. You know, you can um, kind of... No, I think I can just leave it at that. And uh, all right. Um, we'll get into the other things that I've saved for what I expect to be responses. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I can I, I save a little on the tank for uh, my rebuttal. Yeah, for sure. All right. So thank you for your opening statement, David Costello. Um, and so now we're going to get ready for Rabbi Eduardo Radar Apologetics to get into his 10 minute opening statement. In the meantime, everyone, please hit that like button and uh, subscribe to these channels. And, you know, if you guys want to find these guys, I'll see what more they have to say. Radar Apologetics. And you can look up what David uh, Costello has going on as well. Um, but in the meantime, you're here right now. Hit that like button so that this video can get in the algorithm so most people can see this discussion. All right. As soon as you begin, Rabbi, your time starts. Oh, I want to start by thanking Avery from God Logic Apologetics for moderating and hosting this debate on his channel. I also want to thank my opponent, David, from Ahava Sechenam for being here. I also want to open by stating that there are near and dear brothers and sisters of mine who have very positive views on Orthodox Halakha, the oral law, a.k.a. the Torah Shabbat Peh. So I'd like to clarify my position. I believe that one can hold to most of Orthodox Halakha, Jewish law, and have no issues with the New Testament or faith in Yeshua, as Halakha does not really dictate what one believes, but typically what one practices. All Messianic Jews operate in aspects of the oral law. What is on trial here is not whether we can operate in the oral law or do those things. The question is, did God obligate Messianic Jews to observe Orthodox Halakha? See, the issue is not with rabbinic practice, but with the rabbinic worldview. I'm arguing today that it is the rabbinic worldview and its view on the origin of the oral law, which are incongruent with the Hebrew Bible and faith in Yeshua. Since we believe and know and trust that Hashem authored the Hebrew Bible, and since David and I both agree that Yeshua faith is consistent with the Hebrew Bible, it is the rabbinic worldview which is the odd man out, not matching the foundations laid before it. So when it comes to answering the debate topic today, are Messianic Jews obligated to keep Orthodox Halakha by the Lord? The answer is an unequivocal no. My answer is a no because, according to my rabbinically minded friends, Orthodox Halakha is derived from and part of the oral law. In this debate, I will demonstrate that there is no Tanakh slash God sanctioned oral law. Since a Tanakh slash God sanctioned oral law does not exist and cannot be proven, there cannot be a Tanakh God sanctioned Orthodox Halakha, which Messianic Jews are obligated by Hashem to follow. Remember, if God sanctioned, if a God sanctioned oral Torah cannot be proven, then there is no God sanctioned Orthodox Halakha. Understand and don't lose sight. That the error of an authoritative oral accompaniment to the written Torah is part of a great tragedy of revisionist history. This I will prove since there is not a stitch of evidence for a God-sanctioned, universally binding oral tradition going all the way back to Moses on Mount Sinai. I'll read to you Exodus 24-7. Then he, Moses, took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing. Notice a book of the covenant to the people. And they said, 
all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. What the Lord spoke was inside of that written book. So Moses took the blood, sprinkled on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. What words, brothers and sisters? Written words. The covenant is based on what was written in a book of the covenant. You can't have a book of the covenant with words that are oral because oral is not written Deuteronomy 27 then Moses and the elders of Israel charged the people saying keep all the commandments which I command you today so it shall be on the day when you cross the Jordan to the land which the Lord your God gives you that you shall set up for yourself large stones coat them with line write on them what the words of this law the laws by which the covenant was made which were written you shall build the altar of the Lord your God of uncut stones and you shall offer on it burnt offerings to the Lord your God and you shall sacrifice peace offerings, eat there, rejoice before the Lord your God. You shall write on the stones all the words of this law very distinctly, written words to a written law. The Torah of Moses, which is made with Israel, was only written, brothers and sisters. There was never a universally binding oral accompaniment given to the written Torah, according to the Hebrew Bible. Therefore, God never authorized the oral law. Dr. Brown, in his Jewish Objections to Jesus, Volume 5, states, Every single time, and this is important, that the Hebrew Bible refers to the law slash teaching of Moses, the Torah to Moshe, it is referring to the written Torah. That's Joshua 8, 1 Kings 2, 2 Kings 14, 23, Malachi 3, Daniel 9, 13, Ezra 3, Ezra 7, Nehemiah 8, 2 Chronicles 23, 30, 34, every single time. Conversely, there is not a single time in the entire Hebrew Bible where someone is rebuked or punished for breaking the law of Moses when it does not refer to what is written, not a single time. If someone was indicted for breaking the Torah of Moses or if reference was made to the Torah of Moses, it meant one thing and one thing only, the written Torah. And it was that written Torah that our forefathers were called to keep and quote with Dr. Brown. Our rabbinically inclined friends would have us buy into their progressive rabbinism, stating that halakha developed naturally. But no, this is not the understanding of rabbinic Judaism. According to rabbinic Judaism. It is the written and oral law that are the Torah of Moses, and they were both given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Yet remember Dr. Brown's words. Every single time the Hebrew Bible refers to the law or teaching of Moses, Torah Moshe, it is referring to what is written. I charge my opponent in this debate to show me one place definitively anywhere in the whole Tanakh where the Torah of Moses is referring to an oral Torah. The rabbinic worldview is the Torah is divine meaning that it was from the mouth of God, the words of God, and they were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. If this is true, then why is there not one stitch of evidence that Moses, Joshua, or any of the prophets knew about it? This must be answered. My friend gave us uh, an opening statement about the origins of the oral law. I will read to you the Talmud specifically. Berachot 5a proves that the oral law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Rabbi Levi Bar Chama said that Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish Commenting on Exodus 24, 12 says, God said to Moses, this is the verse, ascend to me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you the stone tablets and the Torah and the mitzvah that I've written that you may teach them. And look at what the rabbis say, meaning that God revealed to Moses, not only the written Torah, but all of the Torah, nothing left. Anyone who tells you that something is added later, added afterwards, they are in disagreement with the oral Torah, brothers and sisters. It goes on to say the tablets, these are the Ten Commandments. The Torah is the five books of Moses. The mitzvah is the Mishnah, which includes the explanations for the commandments that I've written, refers to the prophets and the writings, that they were written by the Holy Spirit, divine inspiration, Ruach HaKodesh, that you may teach them, refers to the Gemara, which explains the Mishnah. And look at what the Talmud tells us. These explanations are the foundation for the ruling of practical halakha. The fact that these things were given on Mount Sinai is where we derive halakha from. If you don't have these given on Mount Sinai, then you can have no orthodox halakha. Therefore, Messianic Jews can never be obligated to orthodox halakha because there was no oral Torah ever given on Mount Sinai. If the Talmud states that the Torah, the prophets, the writings, the Mishnah, and the Gemara were given to Moses on Mount Sinai, then why is Moses unaware of it? And why is Hashem unaware of the oral accompaniments he gave to Moses when he tells Joshua, Keep this book of the law, not to keep the oral accompaniments after, keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Not to meditate on the Mishnah, not to meditate on the Gemara, not to meditate on the oral editions, but to meditate on the book of the law. You can't have a book of the law if it's not written. The answer is, it didn't exist. In addition, I want to posit for all the listeners that the consciousness within rabbinic Judaism of the oral Torah, the Torah Shebalepe, does not exist until the Gaonic period, the 700 common era. We don't even see the phrase Torah Shebalepe in rabbinic texts until the 700s. In addition, I submit that holding to a belief in the divine oral Torah God given by God to Moses is an utterly indefensible position by someone who holds to the Messiahship 
of Yeshua. Remember, the question isn't if Yeshua did things in line with the oral law. The question is, did Yeshua ever break the oral law? To recap, Rabbinic Judaism claims the oral Torah is authorized by God. I am charging my opponent to, one, show us in the written Torah where the Torah of Moses refers to an oral law. Number two, answer, why is it that we only hear about the oral Torah in the Geonic period, 700 Common Era, since according to Baruchel 5a, it was given to Mount Sinai. Number three, answer how he can believe in Yeshua as Messiah when Messiah himself broke aspects of the oral law. The belief in a God-authorized oral Torah leading to a God-authorized Orthodox Halakha is a position that will force the Messianic Jew to state that God has declared Yeshua is not the Messiah since the oral Torah rejects his Messiahship. But since there's no God sanctioned, universally binding oral law that was given to Moses, there cannot be a God-authorized Orthodox Halakha. Therefore, Messianic Jews cannot be obligated by Hashem to keep the Orthodox Halakha. I charge my opponent in this debate to prove that the oral Torah, when it refers to Torah Moshe, was given on Mount Sinai, and that the things within the New Covenant that the Jews are participating in, that the Jews of the first century were doing, are indeed the same thing as the oral Torah that the rabbis later receive, or if it is something different. If he does not prove this, if he does not make this part of his argumentation, his rebuttal period, then he has failed the position of proving that Messianic Jews are obligated by Hashem to keep the oral Torah. And with that, I yield the rest of my time. All right. Thank you, Rabbi Eduardo, for that opening statement. Guys, if you're enjoying this conversation, um, make sure you hit that like button so that the algorithm can catch this video. Um, we have uh, about 165 people in here, so there should at least be 165 likes on this video, y'all. Y'all know what happens if you don't uh, hit that like button, which we, which, what we know about you, that you're secretly kissing that black stone. So don't be one of those, all right? All right, now we're going into the rebuttal period, and which is... Uh, which is uh how much how many how much minutes was it on the rebuttal again? It was uh five minutes, I think. It was five minutes was it five minute rebuttals? No, it's three minutes for two rounds. Got it, got it. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. So three minute rebuttals. David Costello, your time starts as soon as you begin. Great. So again, to clarify my position, there are two things in the Orthodox world as far as the understanding of the oral law. One is that everything was given to Moshe at Sinai. There is the opposing opinion mentioned by the Rambam, who says that there is a person of uh, low intellect who does not think that the rabbis themselves were able to establish uh, the law um, and that it was not all given to Moses at Sinai. The idea is that the only the permission for the rabbis to establish and rule in the laws we find in Exodus uh, chapter 18 with the establishment of Yisro and the people who would oversee and come to the rulings. There is, my um, <clears throat> my opponent said that I have to show where there is um, established oral law within that is not mentioned in the five books of Moses in the scriptures. And I believe I have already done that, but I will do it again. In Jeremiah 17, 9, Hatsoah is, uh, is defined and that is not uh, something that is stipulated in the five books of Moses. In Nehemiah 10, 30 to 32, um, it is about marrying all of Gentile women. In Acts 16, 2, it is maternal, it is uh, a, a verification of maternal uh, lineage, uh, ancestry. In Matthew 18, 18, muter, uh, muter and Aser, what you bind and what you lose, is a rabbinic understanding. Um, the if I, my question to my opponent is is if it is not binding, why would Yeshua not simply just say that? Why does he actually submit to these things? Why is even some of the midrash included as scripture in Jude one and in, in Jude one nine? In the Hagiga two twenty one to thirty, there are a n numerous uh, things laws about the uh, ideas of tuma, which are mentioned there, which are not mentioned explicitly in the laws of the five books of Moses. We do see this in a number of cases as well. The issue is, is about whether or not it was established at Sinai or whether or not it was established by rabbis. The only thing that I need to prove is that the authority of the rabbis was established at Sinai and that the authority of the, of the rabbis and those who uh, would educate it in Exodus chapter 18, uh, as well as going farther, was established at Sinai and that those rulings as case law would rule on the 
constitution of, if you will, of the five books of Moses. It is. It seems pretty clear to me that there are scripture. There is also <clears throat> places where Torah does not refer to the written Torah. Um, in ha in Haggai two twenty one, uh, it is referring to things which are not found in the five books of Moses. You will not find them anywhere. You have in Matthew five seventeen to twenty one, where Yeshua himself upholds and says that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scholars, you will not be able to see the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Acts twenty eight seventeen. That's, that's, David, that's three minutes, brother. Three minutes, okay. Yeah. All right. So thank you for that, David. Uh, Radar, it's on you as soon as you begin. So I clearly was not rebutted in what I presented in my opening statements. Um, David has given you, as uh, Michael Brown told him, zero plus zero plus zero, which equals zero, no substance. The idea isn't that, according to Deuteronomy 18, that the later teachers of the law, which were the priests, the judges, the Levites that would come up, wouldn't have authority to establish norms. The What is on trial here is, the, is there an entity, the oral Torah, which is equated with the Torah Moshe, that exists inside of the Torah? Is the Torah Moshe ever considered to be oral or was it always written did god himself make a covenant with the people based upon this oral accompaniment and what is written if we can prove or not prove this then we will know if we should follow the orthodox halakha the question is are these teachings are these things that are being brought down coming from the mouth of god my opponent, David Costello, he wants you to believe in this progressive rabbinism, which I think is false. I don't think it's true, and I don't think it's native to the traditional understanding of rabbinic Judaism. This is progressive rabbinism. And I believe, in my personal opinion, that this has come to the fruition because of the conversation between Dr. Michael Brown and Rabbi Tovia Singer, where Orthodox Judaism has had to remove itself from the idea of this binding oral Torah that was given from God on Mount Sinai. I would say that if God is saying in one place, as authorized by the sages, that it's from God, and then in another place he says it's not from God, I would say that we have a schizophrenic God that does not know what he is talking about. How can God make a covenant with the people, bind the people to something that we have no evidence that it ever existed? And as I said in my opening statement, the phrase Torah shall about pay, I need people to understand the phrase Torah shall about pay does not exist inside of the Torah until the 700s. In point of fact, I'll even add this to you. When we have Perke Avot, when it talks about the Torah being handed down, there is no written and oral Torah. It just says that the Torah was passed around through the transmission of the sages as it comes down to the modern era, the Zugot and the pairs in the first century. There is the word oral is not there. And I would phrase this and say this because they were not aware of this idea of an oral Torah. My friend posited that Yeshua did these things, Yeshua operated. Then why did Yeshua say that because of the traditions of the Pharisees, they nullify the word of God? This means that the traditions of the Pharisees, which become the Torah Shabbat Pei, the oral law, according to my friend, were in contradiction to the written word. We don't have a schizophrenic God that's going to have two different views that oppose each other. And with that, I yield my time. All right. Thank you for that. Um, guys, hit that like button. Now we're going into the second rebuttals. David Costello, it's on you. Yes. Again, the idea of... The Torah being given to Moses at Sinai is a divided thing within a, a rabbinic Judaism and Orthodox Judaism to this day. I literally had on an Orthodox Jew from one sect and an Orthodox Jew from another sect in my studies with the Havis Hinnom. And one Orthodox Jew said it was all revealed to Moshe at, at Sinai and the sages are simply, are simply discovering it. The other Jew brought up to me, and I was on with him just a few hours ago, he wrote up to me in the Hagdama to the uh, to the Mishnah by the Rambam. He brings up that it is silly to think that the rabbis did not come up with their own understandings, and it was not a, uh, a progressive rabbinism. It is it far precedes that of Michael Brown as as much as Michael Brown uh, is a bit older than me. He doesn't he is not as old as the Rambam. Uh, the Rambam established this idea of progressive rabbin, uh, rabbinism, as my opponent likes to call it, um, at that time. The other situation is, is that Yeshua himself follows rabbinic. He has no objection in any place or form to the system of rabbinic law. He simply argues using rabbinic law for the justification for a differing opinion. There is also an idea of two 
two sets of Pharisees. You can argue with one set of Pharisee and agree with the other, such as the case in Mark chapter 7. The establishment at that time, uh, if Mark chapter 7 was written before 30 of the Common Era, which is or occurred before the 30 of the Common Era, it is possible. The reason that the oral law is not explained or talked about as the oral law um, before the time of Yehuda Hanasi who wrote it down is because it was forbidden to write it down. You were you were under an obligation of death if you did, in fact, write the oral law down. And so, therefore, that is why it was not written down until 700 of the Common Era, or 250 of the Common Era. The Mishnah, um, the, the Mishnah and, uh, was the of foundation of the oral law. It accurately records that of what is stated. Um, Paul himself says that the Jews have the oracles of God. He says that we should, uh, Paul himself also says that I have not done anything, anything to violate the customs of our ancestors, of our fathers. Therefore, if it is good enough for Paul, it is good enough for us. The idea that it was established by God is something that Paul would have to wrestle with. If it was not established by God, Paul would have no reason to follow it, nor would Yeshua as my opponent um, who would believe in a Trinitarian idea would bring up the idea uh, that um, he would bring up this idea that that uh, he would have. Why would uh, God Himself follow oral law if it was not? The other thing is, is that God is kind and merciful, and He can give us an opportunity to come up with things for ourselves. The, the Torah is not in heaven on earth, but or, but it is on earth where we can use it. Sorry, I went a little over. Apologize about that. You're muted, Avery. No, yeah, that's okay. I, I wanted you to be able to land your plane. You know, I didn't want to cut you off in the middle of that, but but yeah, good stuff. All right. Um, Rabbi Eduardo, it's on you now. So the uh Yeshua does part with rabbinic law at many points, but later becomes the oral law. Um, Yeshua operates in many of the traditions, the mehangam of what would have been normal within first century Judaism. But my friend David Costello is making the mistake of equating Yeshua doing the same things that later become part of the oral law with him actually uh, affirming and operating in the oral law because of this system called the oral law. There is no foundation for it. It is not mentioned in the new covenant. It does not exist. It is not articulated. Even though they're doing minhagim and customs from how they understand and commandments that were given there he still has not proven that this has been authorized by god for all people to operate in all david has said to us was listen they did these things that later become part of the oral law therefore we should operate in the oral law as it is now this is a non sequitur this is not the same exact thing there are times when they parted with it there was times that they did it as we're going to go through in the in the cross section we'll examine some of these things and i'll ask my opponent about some of the passages in scripture where it seems that these things were broken remember you cannot say that it was from heaven and then not from heaven yet we have the authority for them to pass down the oracles of god if the oral torah are the oracles of god then why are they utterly contradictory at every single point i would say the phrase elu ve elu de el Elohim, Devarim, Chaim, these are the words of the living God, that it is a mistake to say that. And this is a cop-out because of the utter contradictions that exist inside of the oral law. When we apply that which rabbinic Judaism has presented with us to the Hebrew Bible, it is an absolute not in the same category. I can take a 10-year-old person who knows plain Hebrew, and I can let them read the first book of Samuel, and they can learn about the story of Samuel as it develops without any background information, only knowing the plain Hebrew. Yet, if, a per if that take that same 10-year-old and I give them a track date of the Mishnah and they go to read it, they would have zero idea about what is going on. Why? Because this is a constructed system later that is clearly not the Word of God and clearly not authoritative. There are acronyms within it and a background to that text that you absolutely need to understand or else you cannot read this material. How can the oral Torah be from God, dictated by God, constructed by God, led by God, but keep people so, so far away from knowing God's truth and reality. If you read the Hebrew Bible plainly from beginning to end, you will know the God of Israel. If you read the Mishnahic material from beginning to end, all you will know is Jewish folklore and legend. You will never ever come to know the God of Israel alone. And with that, I yield my time. All right, man, that was beautiful. Okay, so now we're going into the next section, which is the cross-examination. So the cross-examination will be uh, three minutes each. You're only able to ask 
questions and the person answers. So you get three minutes of this part each time. We're going to do this twice, okay? Um, in the meantime, before we go over, uh, make sure you guys, you hit that like button. Oops. Make sure that uh, make sure that the likes are matching up our viewership. We got 177 people in here, so let's make sure that the likes match up so that the algorithm can catch it. Um, and so now let's go ahead. Without further ado, let's go ahead into the three-minute cross-examination. <clears throat> David, it's on you, I believe. Mm -hmm. I'm asking questions. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, so Radar Apologies, Robbie Awardo, you asked, you say, stated that there are numerous occasions where Yeshua himself uh, violates um, oral law. Um, I would love for you to give some examples of that, if that's possible. Is that sure, where, yeah. what are these uh, so-called violations of oral law that you're referring to? Sure, netilat yadaim. Okay. In the washing of hands. Um, do I get to respond to that, or do I only ask questions at this point? It's across. You just ask questions. Okay. Only, only questions. Okay. Um, Save it for the open discussion, though. Okay. Um. Uh, are there any other instances where he would you would say that he would violate oral law? Plucking grain on Shabbat, a healing the sick on Shabbat. Typically, it's uh, for pekuach nefesh for the saving of a life. Yeshua never did a healing where life was in danger. Okay, um, what are um, some of your understandings of then who you should follow for the interpretation of Scripture? Who should I follow for the interpretation? Is that related to the topic? Um, yeah, well, I mean, as dealing with the the oral law, right? So I use the oral law um, mm -hmm. to interpret scripture and to follow out how I should live my life. So who would you say, if not for the rabbis, who would you say then uh, what authority is there for that? I would say according to Luke chapter 7, Yeshua said that those who didn't take the immersion of John, the baptism of John, they forfeited God's purpose for their life. So while I believe that God had a purpose for the Pharisaic movement, that any of those individual Pharisees who forsook <clears throat> the immersion of John, uh, going from the lesser to the greater, they forfeited God's purpose for their life. How much more so if someone rejects the immersion of the Messiah, they forfeit God's purpose, and they forfeit sitting in the seat of Moses. So as we go forward through time and history, it is those who took the immersion of Yeshua who are the bearers of God's uh, revelation and truth and interpretation of the text. What we have in the New Covenant reality is Paul going along, setting up local kahal, kehilot, local congregations, ecclesias for the community to operate in, and he establishes them as their authority and gives them their own individual traditions to participate that are not universally binding. So would you agree then that it was uh, that it was uh, that the authority of the Pharisaic Jews was replaced by the authority of the Kiela um, of the church? No, I would say that it was given from one group of Pharisees to another group of Pharisees, uh, given from the Pharisaic movement of the leaders of the day and given over to Paul and his Pharisaic disciples who later gave that authority on to others. All right. Well, only got about five seconds left, so I don't know if there's time, but um, just hold that off. Uh, okay. And so now let's go ahead with uh, Radar Apologetics. Your turn. Cool. So, David, what determines if something is the Word of God? If something is the Word of God? Yeah. Um, that it is something which is um, established as Scripture. It is breathed out. It is profitable for reproof. Mm -hmm. um for thank you is the torah shabal pay profitable for reproof it is not held even in rabbinic judaism it's not what i asked you is the torah shabal pay profitable for reproof yes thank you so much so the, according to you the talmud is scripture did rambam believe that the mission of gomorrah no no you can't ask me questions my time does rambam believe that the mission of the gomorrah were given to moses on mount sinai the Rambam in the Gemara. Forget it, forget it. Next question. Um, do you believe that the Rambam brings down halakha about belief? Do you believe that Rambam brings down halakha about belief? Yes. Okay, uh, good, because in Dr. Brown's video with you at 6 minute and 4 seconds, you quote said, we believe also that it is halakhically required to believe in the Messiah, as the Rambam has said in his Mishnah Torah. So Rambam can bring down beliefs about halakha, yes or no? Beliefs about halakha? Can Rambam bring down beliefs about halakha? Can he bind you halakhically to a belief? Yes or no? Yes. 
Okay, exactly. Because you know what the Rambam says in his Hakdama, his introduction to the Mishnah? He says the intent of both Talmuds is to elucidate the words of the Mishnah, to explain its deeper points, and to relate the new matters that were developed by each court from the era of Yehuda the Prince until the composition of the Talmuds. From the entire body knowledge, from the two Talmuds, the Tosefta, the Sifra, the Sifre, can be derived the forbidden, the permitted, the impure, and the pure, the liable. Those are free liability valid. And this was all received in tradition, one person from another, in a chain extending back to Moses on Mount Sinai. Do you believe, according to this, that Rambam binds you halakhically to believe that the Oral Torah was given on Mount Sinai? I believe that is a misrepresentation of uh, how halakha works. Uh, there oh, are... uh, did Rambam misrepresent it? I give me you represent. I believe that you misrepresent. I read Rambam. What? Did I read Rambam or did I not read Rambam? You misunderstand the halakha. Rambam. So thank you very much. So Rambam says Rambam. we go by Shulchan Aruch. We you don't go by Rambam. Rambam? We go by Rambam. We go by. I want everybody to go back and listen to the video to see how much my man quoted Rambam. I'm gonna uh, just one more time. Does Rambam say that it was all received? The two Talmuds, the Tosefta, the Sifra, and the Sifra were received by God on Mount Sinai. That it was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Does Rambam say that in his introduction to the Mishnah 124 in the transmission of the law? It's anybody can find it on Safari. Introduction to the Mishnah 124. Rambam says that it was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Does he say that? Yes or no? I am unfamiliar with that, but I can tell you about... You're unfamiliar with... My man, you quoted... Uh, just a question. Are, would you admit that you quoted the Hagdama without ever really reading it? I've read the Hagdama. I read the Hagdama. So you should be familiar with this. So I've read Hagdama 9. So one last question. If you read the Hagdama, should you be familiar it, with this? Yes, but it is Then another out. question, another question. That's it. That's another it. question. That's it. That's it. That's it. After, in, in Hagdama chapter 9... You That's have it. a you have a uh, a dissection of that and the ludication of that simple statement. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. All right. Wow. All right. So David Costello, it is now your turn once again to drill radar apologetics for three minutes. My question is: is um, you questioned me about the Hagdama in a section that I was not referring to. I was referring to section nine. If why do you continue to use rabbinics if you do not hold to their authority? Do not feel that that is um, disingenuous. Which one? can you say that question again? I think it was you two questions. You quoted Rambam and uh, his Hagdama into the Mishnah in a chapter that I did not quote. Why do you use to prove your point something which you do not believe in? Because you believe in it. But you don't. I don't. So then you can't use it to prove anything. Is that a why, statement or a question? Why can you, how can you use it then to prove anything? I can use it because it sh gives us a snapshot of the belief of rabbinic Judaism during the middle period, since Rambam is one of the most authoritative halachic uh, cod codifiers of Jewish law. Therefore, while we have many voices within the Talmudic text and the Talmudic material, it is Rambam himself who still distills it down for us to understand what the rabbinic opinion should be. Uh, there is also the Shulchan Aruch, there is also the Mishnah of Ruah, there are also many other halakhic texts by which we can go by. The Rama has, in fact, his... Uh, is this a question? Yeah, is this a, you got a four minute question, brother. Well, he asked me a question, so I'm responding to his question. No, I don't think he I answered it. Mm. Um, but go ahead, if you, if you can formulate it, I paused your time. If you can formulate what you're just about to say into a question, that would be excellent. Right. So the issue is, is do you not understand that there are multiple version, there are multiple halakhic authorities, not simply the Rambam? I do, and that's why there's no oral Torah. Because there are mul you you say that because there are multiple halakhic uh, rulings that there can no longer be any halakhic Torah. You cannot say elo ve elo. No, what I'm saying is, is that not because there are multiple halakhic rulings, because there are um, contradictory inconsistent, indefensible halakhic rulings within the rabbinic material. What are some of those that you would say are defensible? What you just mentioned about it being from Moses on Mount Sinai, yet uh, your progressive rabbinism that you try to shoehorn into traditional Judaism. There is in, 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 okay, I can't, uh, quite, I can't make a statement. I have to, this is a little bit difficult. Sorry, I'm getting used to this. All right, take it um, <laughs> So you do not believe in the synchronization of different things. Would you also hold that for the is that a question? Yes, mm -hmm. I'm getting to the question. Would you also hold that that is uh, applicable also to the Gospels, which also there seem to be um, contradictory statements as well? No. 
So you do not hold the contradictory statements to be a problem in the New Testament, but you do hold them to be a contradiction in the halakhic sources. That would be presupposing that there are contradictions? No, it would be presupposing that there are contradictions within a halakha. Um, so you presuppose that there are contradictions inside of halakha. Is that correct? I don't, I don't presuppose you demonstrated and said from your mouth that there are contradictions within the halakha and different points of view on its origin story. Do you think that there could also be similar situations uh, in the New Testament text, such as Acts chapter 7 and other places along those lines? I believe that in their uh, autographs, the Word of God is completely uncontradictory and fully inspired by the Word of God. Yet there were many scribes involved with the process of transmission. And because of that, we have some variants that have crept in in the different point of views of different uh, New Testament authors. All right. So that's our time, guys, for that. Um, we're about to go into the next section, which is the open <laughs> discussion for five minutes straight. I'm excited for this part, actually. So uh, no, I got one more rebut. I got one more cross. You got one more cross. Mm -hmm. It's two. Oh, it is on you. That's yeah, right. On me. Dang, I didn't I, I didn't even it's all give good. It to you. I didn't want to give it to you, but whatever. I guess <laughs> I, guess, I guess I'll let you go. I'm not, you know. <laughs> all right. So one more one more cross examination for uh, Rabbi Eduardo. Um, so it's on you. Give give him a little bit of chance, a little bit of time to get a breath out when when he. Sure, tries you to got it. it. Sure. All right, go ahead, David. How do you feel? Good. Good. Okay. How do you reconcile the fact that the Word of God, the New Testament, states that Yeshua is the Messiah, yet in the Gemara, the Word of God, according to Rambam, states Yeshua is not the Messiah, and that he's a sinner being punished with boiling excrement in the Gittim fifty-seven a. His mother was an immoral woman. Uh, 104, Sanhedrin 67a. He was a son who turned out badly, uh, Sanhedrin 103. That he was a wicked disciple, Sanhedrin 107b, Salta 47a, among other references. Uh, my answer to that would be that all of those do not match up with the time period of the actual Yeshua and the dating of the Yeshua. So therefore, it is a different Yeshua. There are, uh, Yeshua, is a Yeshua and Yeshua were popular names at the time. Um, uh, at, the, at this time, at the time of the Tanium and also at the time of the Gemara. Am I hearing you say that they got the timeline wrong? Yes. Okay. Well, All right. no, they didn't get the timeline wrong. It's speaking of a different person. Are you saying that the sages didn't know the timeline? The sages don't have, the sages are, uh, making an argument again. I would say that the sages um, have the timeline, and because they are so different in, in all those situations, they are from vastly different times. I would say that it is, is an argument being used against Christianity in general, not against Yeshua himself. The does the Talmud have any knowledge of Yeshua? Yes. Where? In Hulan 84a, uh, Yaakov Amina gives a ruling on the covering of blood, and he is treated favorably. In Megillah 23a, um, it is also, and it is also quoted in Shabbos 116b, where it is quoted positively as, is named as Avon Gilion. Okay. So, um, actually in Sanhedrin 43a to b, it references the crucifixion of Yeshua on the eve of Passover. It uses the name Yeshua Notsri. Isn't it likely that when they're referring to Yeshua Notsri in other places, that they're speaking about the same person? And if they're not, can you prove it? Yes. Yehoshua ben Parachia existed at a different time. And it says that the um, that the Yeshu Hanosri, who was uh, in Gittin 57, was a Talmud of Yehosh ben Parakia. Okay, so all you're telling me is that the rabbis didn't even have their calendar correct? So how can they have the oracles of God to convey them correct in an oral edition and transmission? Would you agree or disagree with that statement? No, I'm disagreeing with that statement. Uh, I would say that they, they are making an argument against Christianity, as I said before. They are making an argument against Christianity, not a specific person of Yeshua. On O3, because in other places, uh, such as Sefer Gilgalim, where uh, the Arizal uh, says that Yeshua is um, buried among the righteous, um, he makes a different statement as well. Yeshua Nosri, you can argue that that is a different Yeshua Nosri, but there's also Moshe David Valley, who says that Yeshua Nosri is, in fact, Mashiach Ben Yosef. That's our time. All right, going into the next section, uh, the five-minute open discussion. So where they could just bounce off each other, talk to each other, gaze in each other's eyes, that type of thing. Um, so let's go ahead and get there. We have 
225 people in here. Guys, let's make sure that there's at least 225 likes on this video so that um, the video can catch the algorithm and it could be seen by others who need to hear this conversation. This has, uh, you know, I've never heard this type, this side of the discussion before about the oral law. And so uh, I'm enjoying this. I hope that you guys are enjoying this and learning from it. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into it. Five minutes open discussion. Um, you guys can now start saying hi to each other. Hi, David. Hey, Eduardo. Hey, what's up, man? Yeah. You can go first. You can kick it off. Um, for me, or do you want uh, me to? Uh, I can. Uh, let me cut it, kick it off. You're uh, you're sure, pretty uh, pretty good at this. You've uh, you've had experience. Uh, this is sort of a new thing for me. Yeah, it's my uh, first debate. For, right for me, it, debate, uh, right first moderated debate, uh, which I appreciate actually. Um, one of the things that is really just important to me is it doesn't detract from my understanding of Yeshua at all. One of the things that I just want to say and make sure that I get that clear, it doesn't detract from my understanding of Yeshua. And in fact, it increases my love of Yeshua um, with the ability, with his knowing the background of all the ideas that were sort of going Would you on. agree that that's the, that that's an, uh, an assertion that you're making? That's an assumption that you're making that the later, and I wanted to correct you on a mistake earlier. Um, you say that the Mishnah was compiled around 220, 250. That is correct. But what I'm saying is that even in the Mishnahic material, the phrase, Torah shall about pay, oral law does not exist until the year 700. Would you agree with that? Um, possibly. I mean, the, the issue of whether or not the phrase exists in writing is not so much of a concern for me as whether or not we can trust Jews to accurately pass down the halakha with the way of life. That they well, do. I don't think, um, is there any verse that says that the Jews should hand down the halakha or is it say that they're going to hand down the word of God? Because I think you made a presupposition that oracles of God refer to the halakha versus actually the words of God, the Torah Moshe, the, the, the words of God that were given that were written. We have no evidence, like I said, in the Hebrew Bible that what is the oracles of God or the word of God have an oral accompaniment. So is there anywhere in the world that you can prove that that exists? Do you have any extra biblical sources outside of the Bible outside of your own tradition that states that an oral law existed? Um, we have uh, Josephus that talks about different uh, rulings of that. I mean, there's... Um, mm -hmm. uh, but does he talk about an oral law? Does he say oral law? He talks about the customs of the Jews. I mean, the New Testament... Ah, see, customs I give you, but an, an authoritative oral law. I had another question. I was thinking about this. Will belief in the oral law force someone to change what the New Testament says? No. Plainly said. No. Can I can I can I throw some at you? You put up a post a few days ago, and you said uh, you were quoting the book Sefer Chassidim, and remember that the New Testament tells us to share the gospel of Yeshua with the whole world. Agree? Yes or no? Yes. So you quoted a book Sefer Chassidim that would be part of the Torah Shabbat Pay, and look at what you would say. You put and you wrote quote another answer to theology that we should not share who Yeshua is as Messiah. So you're using rabbinic texts to prove that we shouldn't share Yeshua, yet you just told me that rabbinic tradition and the oral Torah won't cause you to contradict what the New Testament says. Here, you clearly contradicted it. Um, no, no. So please, I would like to hear what you have to say about that. Yeshua. I mean, I have a Chavis Hinnom ministry, so I should get, get a pump out for that. I believe in sharing Yeshua. This, to me, is the argument against the ortho... There's a, there's a set of messianics who don't believe that uh, Yeshua is necessary to be shared with the Orthodox Jews. I believe that Orthodox Jews definitely need Yeshua as Messiah. Uh, need but that's not what you said in your quote in your post, though. I'm, no. I'm really trying to give you the time to answer right. and speak, but that's I'm not what you you stated say. something in your post that contradicted the New Testament based upon rabbinic tradition. No. This is the error with your I, perspective. I'm using I am using the Sefer Hasidim to prove that we need to share Yeshua. No, I your quote, the, answer, did your post say not share Yeshua or to share Yeshua? It's an argument against, another argument against the argument to not share Yeshua. I believe in sharing Yeshua. This is a debate that I'm having with another Messianic group, the, uh, several other Messianic groups that get into this trap of not wanting to share Yeshua but and wanting it? to be observant. So but if, if I'm correct, if I could pull up the reference, wasn't the reference for us not to reveal? I mean, I could probably pull up the post right now. Wasn't the reference to not reveal what no. God has in to not take glory from God? I mean, because no. I can probably pull up the reference right now. If we under with no, the reference is I know exactly what reference you're talking about. The reference from Sefer Hasidim is, is that if you have a and this is the point that I was trying to make, 
if you have a revelation, if you have something that Hashem has revealed to you, an insight into Torah, it is your obligation to share that, uh, to share that revelation, which to me would be the Messiah, who Messiah is, which would be Yeshua as Messiah. The Sefer Hasidim says you have an obligation to do so. If you do not reveal that insight which Hashem has given to you, that insight that Hashem has given to you about Messiah being, uh, about Yeshua being the Messiah, then you are stealing from God, and it is a very okay. serious option. Okay, so you meant it in a different way. That's fine. We can keep going. How do you yeah. reckon? I have a question. How do you reconcile the fact that Yeshua spent so much time talking with women at the well? But according to Mishnah Sanhedrin, chapter 1, one who excessively talks with a woman causes evil to himself, neglects the study of Torah, and in the end inherits purgatory. This is in the mind of track. This is in the mind of track that Derek Aretz. Our yo, there's more. So the, the rabbinic tradition, the oral Torah, the quote, oracles of God, according to you, says we shouldn't talk to women. Yet, yet Yeshua spends many time talking to women. What would you say? Uh, she's not Jewish. And so that changes the um, out. Uh, that changes he's, the issue. So he's allowed to hang out with not Jewish women? I mean, Rabino Tom says it, you're anyway, I'm not going to do that because that's going to be used to. Uh, uh, does that, does uh, this does, does this I, does this source make a distinction in Mishnah Sanhedrin between a Gentile woman or a Jewish woman, or does uh, it say all women? I believe it does. Yeah, it says all women. So you you yourself have added to the oracles of God, um, what you consider the oracles of God, and I think it's a mistake. Um, I don't think it's a mistake to talk to a woman per se. Um, but you disagree are... with the sages? No, you cannot. Don't talk they have the oracles of God? To a woman. So the the again that's being taken out of context um the issue of talking to women has to do with a number of, of situations right so this is the idea of getting into immorality this is the laws of yikas i mean it, but is that in the context is that in the halacha though the halacha says don't talk to a woman excessively period yeah. no it, it's in context It's within a larger context and so do it, not speak excessively with the woman for good. all. All right, I'll read you another one. Derek Eretz Ariel Talacha, 13. Do not speak excessively with women for all women's conversations are lewdness. According to Chazal, the sage is your authority. Do you agree or disagree? It's talking about within a situation of Yechud. Uh, we can dance about, also all night if you want, brother. It, is, this, is, it, is it all women's conversations are lewdness, yes or no? You have do you know more than the sages? No, I do not let know more than that. Okay. But, but you have to put it into a larger context of understanding the other things that it also talks about with women, how you go about having conversations with women, why it's wrong to excessively talk with them. It is also talked talk about in another uh, portion in the Talmud where there was a rabbi who crawled underneath the bed to see what he, how he would talk to his wife before intimacy. The, the, you, you can't say that you can't talk to women. Uh, it's in the rabbis all over the place. There's also another place uh, in the Talmud where it talks about that. And I know you're going to say that this is me self-contradicting the Talmud, the Talmud self-contradicting itself, where the Talmud has women riding on shoulders uh, of people. And so therefore you have to have an, uh, a, 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 an ability to understand and rationalize these. The same thing I think happens with the synoptic gospels and the, and the gospel of John. There are significant differences that I think are allowed to be um, uh, that are allowed to be rationalized and harmonized out. The issue with having double standards of rationalizing and harmonizing the de definite distinctions between the Synoptic Gospels and the Gospels of John, I think, can also be done between the issues in the Talmud as well as between the Talmud and the New Testament. You have not answered the case about how, how Yeshua broke the oral law by speaking excessively with women. The halakhaz, you don't do it. Yeshua did it. Yeshua broke the oral law. Therefore, again, the oral law can't be from the mouth of God, period, point blank. Again, it is outside of context. The issues, the other issues that you brought up, um, the other we're issues at, that you brought up time, with, the, with the grain, we're out of time. Yeah, we're out We've of time. We've been out of time. <laughs> yeah, I, I let you guys go over for like a, a, a minute and 30 more. That's okay. So, uh, I was enjoying that, so. Yeah. Appreciate but it. yeah, so so now it's, it's so now we're at the closing statements. Now we're at the closing statements. Um, let me see here. So I believe it's uh, yeah, it's five minutes each closing statements, um, and then we're going to do a uh, a twenty minute Q and A after. So guys, get your questions ready. Um, I'm trying to, you know, get there's already somebody asking questions, so I'm ordering these things in. So right now, think of your questions you. so we can have a good flow uh, into this. Okay, uh, so David. Five minutes, whenever you, you're ready. Uh, I'll do it with sort of a little bit of a joke. If it was good enough for Paul and Yeshua, 
uh, is good enough for me. And so uh, we see him keeping the oral law. We see him keeping uh, the Talmud. I do not believe that my opponent has proven uh, that you should not keep it. Um, his argument is whether or not it's given from God. My question, uh, and so I would say that the apostles and Yeshua himself would not do something if it was not given by God. We see them doing it. And so therefore that I think is enough argument for us to keep the oral law as well in the halakha. Um, there is a, a wide variety for you to choose from if you are Messianic Jewish and you're interested in that. Um, there are plenty of resources out there for you. Ahabaschidam.com is one of them. Um, we love to bring the orth, uh, the Messianic Jewish population into a, uh, a more uh, observant lifestyle that is one of our passions because we believe that it is the uh, the mission and the um, and the desire of Yeshua the Messiah. Um, we also believe in sharing Yeshua the Messiah um, with others as well. And so it puts us into a little bit of a niche. But again, I think that I have proven my point that the um, the oral law was followed by Yeshua, by the disciples. The only place where we get the removal of the oral law is when we get to um, when we get to uh, later texts like the, the church fathers and things along those lines. And I do not believe that we need to follow those. Um, hold to scripture, uh, hold to the oral law, which is implicit in scripture, which has been uh, explained. I explained it in ha uh, Hagiga too. Take a look at that for, uh, if you like. Nehemiah 10, um, Jude 1 9, um, the other places where uh, Yeshua is completely within. Uh, one thing that I wanted to say. In closing, I didn't get to in the, uh, in the cross talk uh, that we were doing. Um, the issue of the peeling grain is, again, uh, not an issue. It's miyad biyad be'okol. So that is a halakhic understanding. The healing is also not forbidden according to Jewish law. If you have a limb in danger, um, I have a video on my Havas Himen that which answers that uh, answer as well. Um, the washing of hands was not established until 30 of the Common Era. Um, Yeshua was not in violation of that. It was something that was a stricture of Shammai, uh, which is not the Halakha Masora, and was not established until after. Um, the, uh, the other places where they're brought out that he may, viol in fact, violate um, Halakha are actually um, argued, uh, can be argued from our modern or uh, Halakhic sources. Um, he was in full keeping with the Halakha, and he encouraged Jews to keep the Torah, uh, not only the <clears throat> minute uh, minutia of Beit Shemai, but also the middos of Beit Hillel. And so one of the reasons that he's such a lightning type character is because he insists that not only on your character being well, but also in your strictness with keeping the minutia and the humras and the stringencies of the rabbis. And so try to do both of those. And uh, I think you're in good uh, in a good place if you're able to. Uh, that's my closing argument. I believe I've made my point. Um, there are some things that uh, Rabbi Awarder has uh, gotten me to think about. Um, I thank him for this discussion. And as it says in the oral law, all uh, debates for the sake of heaven are worth it. And so uh, I appreciate this uh, this time to debate uh, with uh, Rabbi Eduardo. Amen. All right. Um, all right, Rabbi Eduardo, whenever you're ready. Yeah. Um, so, David, thank you as well. And um, it's, it's not going unnoticed that you are referring to me as Rabbi Eduardo. So that amount of respect goes a long way. You don't need to do that. So I, I do um, thank you for that. And I thank you for the time that you had. And thank you, Avery, again. Um, just as, as a clarification point, you know, I do many things that are rabbinic. The reality and the truth of what we're talking about here is did the question of the debate was did Hashem, did the Lord obligate Messianic Jews to observe and to operate in Orthodox Halakha, that he obligate them to do that. And the reality is, I said that we can operate in it, but we are not obligated by God. And some of the reasons why I laid out that is because the Torah of Moses, which the Jewish people are obligated to, was never given with an oral accompaniment, and it was never demonstrated. What David demonstrated was that later on within the prophets and the writings, they had minhagim, traditions that develop, but nowhere has it been clearly demonstrated and expressed that these were binding from God, the utter unconstitutional contradictory nature of the Talmud and the rabbinic text proves that this cannot be from the mouth of God because of how inconsistent they are. 
He himself said that Rambam himself can bring down and cause us to have to believe, according to Jewish law, certain things. Rambam himself, in his introduction to the Mishnah 124 in the transmission of the oral law, says that it was all given to Moses on Mount Sinai. One of the things I didn't get to drive home is that this is indeed speaking about Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, within these portions of Yeshua HaNotzri. I invite any single person, as we're talking about books and things to read, to go check out Jesus in the Talmud by Peter Schaefer. And he clearly proves that it was only within the Babylonian period that Jews had autonomy to speak against Yeshua in such a manner. The Talmud is aware of Yeshua, it's aware of his disciples, and there is no other Yeshua, Yeshua HaNotzri, Jesus of Nazarene, that exists within that material that can be proven or demonstrated and to stress it is not if we can operate rabbinically i do many things that are rabbinic i operate in many rabbinic traditions this is not whether we can operate in it or whether the jewish people had traditions that went far back the thing is did god obligate messianic jews to operate in orthodox halakha i've laid down within the halakhic material Mishnah Sanhedrin, a man should not spend excessive time speaking to a woman. Since a man should not spend excessive time speaking to a woman, Yeshua does it. Yeshua broke the oral law. Since Yeshua broke the oral law, the oral law cannot be from the mouth of God. I charged my opponent with a couple of things to start off with. I charged him to show us in the written Torah where the Torah of Moses refers to an oral law. It has not been done. There was no answer given to why we only hear about the Torah Shabbat Pei in the year 700 during the time of the Babylonian period. And he never answered how he can believe in Yeshua as Messiah when Messiah himself broke the oral law. I believe that my friend is delusional that Yeshua was operating in an anachronistic understanding of rabbinic law when the reality is it is not true. Brothers and sisters, remember this. It's very, very important that in Luke chapter 7, Yeshua said, if you reject John's immersion, you forfeit God's purpose for your life, thereby inheriting your seat on Moses' chair. So as we go forward in time, it was those who took the immersion of Yeshua who remained in the seat of Moses. And for me, according to my worldview, this is not an issue because it is Jews and Gentiles together magnifying the God of Israel who sit in the seat of Moses in that chain of transmission. And I'll leave with your last point. It has not been demonstrated that the oracles of God are the oral law. The oracles of God are indeed God's very words where the Jewish people were the gatekeepers of. And let me tell you the beautiful thing about the gospel. Those from the nations are brought near to the covenants and to become co-heirs with the Jewish people in the commonwealth of Israel. This is the gospel. The word of God, the gospel of the New Testament is easily readable for any person, five, six, seven, ten years old. I can explain the gospel to my son clearly, but if I begin to explain him the laws about Shabbat, he will be lost. If I explain to him the laws about kosher and kashrut and all these things that are part of the oral law, he will be lost. But the reality of God is for the whole world to come into the knowledge of him. This is why the word of God is simple and plain for people to understand. The rabbis have added much to God's word to be gatekeepers of God's reality. And the reality is that the gospel is for the whole world. And it is simple and it is plain. I can prove it from my four-year-old son. He knows the gospel. He knows Yeshua. He prays to him. He understands that he's God. He understands that he has to be born again. I bet you that my son knows more about the gospel than another four-year-old will know about rabbinic law. Why? Because it is the words of God for even children and adults. And with that, I yield my time. Okay. Wow. Thank you guys so much for uh, the spirited discussion. It was awesome. It was excellent hearing both sides of this um and honestly we, we need we need more of this i would love to learn more about this this oral law concept and how important it is to the to the jewish community and stuff like that um well so we just ended uh the debate section guys and now we're going to go into the questions the q a um uh, i have some people already listed that have had their questions already ready you guys can keep uh, bringing me in these questions because we have some time okay so Bring in these questions. Um, someone perfect asked, timing. Yeah, it's perfect timing. Uh, Tippy asked about whether or not uh, David was, you know, why he objected to Jesus being the Messiah. So we clarified that you are messianic, that you do believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Yes. And so, yeah. So just wanted to clarify, guys, he is messianic. He believes that Jesus is the Messiah. So we have a question for you, David, uh, from Isaiah uh, Chavez. His question is, where was the oral law? in 2 Kings 22. Why was Josiah so horrified when they rediscovered the Torah, the Torah scroll if they had an unbroken oral, oral Torah from Sinai? 
um, because the words of the Torah are precious. Um, if you uh, go into any Jewish synagogue, you will see a Sefer Torah. Um, these are precious things. They're counted as um, as a person, right? So there's this idea of oral Torah, right? You can do things and not know why you do them. Um, I actually think that this is uh, the case in a lot of the um, sort of Christian world. Uh, the Pope wears a kippah. Why does he wear a kippah? You know, you don't know why you're doing it necessarily. I, I talked to an Anglican priest. Why do you put the water into the wine before you do communion? Um, the, 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 and he gave me, I don't know. We just sort of do it. And so there is a tradition that you can do, but not know why you're doing it. Um, knowing why you're doing it, getting to that Sefer Torah, the, the holiest thing in all of Jewish expression is incredibly exciting. Um, and, and that would be my answer for that. All right, is that, yeah, yeah, is that what the is that what the passage says though? All that extra stuff that you added, or does it say that he found the book of the law? He found the book of the law. Okay, so it's not what you just said. Well, I mean, stuff. if you were to say that they lost the book of the law, then you would say that they lost the the Torah and the Chumash as well. Um, uh, and I'm, I I'm not making a claim, but I mean, I'm just saying, does the Tanakh say that they found the book of the law? Um, they found the book of the law. Yeah. Okay, so is it what you just said? Yeah, I said they have a great joy of finding the book of the law, the 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 written law of Moses, one of the five books. Did you want to make a statement on that, Rabbi, or is that it? That's it? Okay. All right. Um, the next question that we have uh, is from Isaiah again. He says, what do you feel uh, about the seat of Moshe in Matthew 23, 2? I'm surprised that yeah. didn't come up. Yeah. He says, is this about the oral law or is this the seat that they read Torah from in the synagogues? Who's the question for? It's uh, for David, I believe. Okay. Okay. But either, either of you can, you know. So, yeah, I'm surprised it didn't come up either. Um, <clears throat> I had other things that I was researching and I guess they got, well, it'll stop my mind. Yeah, I mean, this is a really good argument for why we should keep the oral law. Um, he says that you should do as they say, not as they do. Um, he is here recognizing the authority of the oral law. When he submits the crucif crucifixion, he is also admitting to the authority of the sages and the rabbis. Um, you always go by the majority, whether or not they are right or wrong. Um, the issue with uh, behaving as they did is an issue which Yeshua is trying to, in my opinion, correct, uh, to bring the full geula, in which we're still sort of dealing with, which is why my organization is called um, chinam, the one of the main issues of the generation of Yeshua was sinat chinam, uh, was baseless hatred. And so he is arguing against that. And so he's saying, don't, don't do as they do. Don't have baseless hatred, but do as they say. Keep the strictures of the laws. He says in Matthew 23, 35, you should tithe mint, dill, and cumin, which is a stringency uh, recorded in Nida 49 and 50, and which is still a, a, a stringency that is talked about today as being a very high level of stringency. He says, you should have done all these things and not neglected um, the weightier manners of the law, right? So there's a, a story in a Talmud of uh, two rabbis at the time of Yeshua, or two, two Kohanim at the time of Yeshua. And the law is, is that if you stab someone with a knife, once the person's dead, then the knife becomes a father of Tuma and can pass on Tuma to other things. And the base impurity, so people know time, impurity, huh? impurity, impurity. Sorry, yeah, uh, the impurity. And so, um, one of the things that I think Yeshua is talking about: don't do as they do. The, the father of the son who is dying out um, said, "Wait, he's not dead yet, so the knife hasn't contracted impurity and can't impart impurity to other things. Use it to sacrifice." And so, for me, that would be the. Uh, don't do as they do, but do as they say, right? So he says, keep the stringencies of tithing mint, dill, and cumin, which is a stringency found in Beit Shammai, um, uh, proposed by a Shemuti in, in what we have as a Talmud. Um, and so he says, keep the minutia of the law, but also have middos that is compassionate and caring and care more about the saving of life than care about the transmission of Tuma. Tuma was a very, impurity was a very big thing um, at the time of the Tanium. And so um, it was a very, it was something that was, it comes back to the washing of hands as well. Um, it was a very, very um, decisive, uh, divisive sort of argument going on within house, within the the uh, Orthodox or within that's anachronistic, within Pharisaic Judaism at that time. Um, and okay. so, so we just, I, 
Okay, so so uh, let's give Radar Apologetics a chance to so, address um, some of what was said in the question. Yeah, thank you. Very simply, the Pharisees did sit in the seat of Moses at the time of Yeshua, okay? And what happened? Paul was a Pharisee. So were the disciples. They were all Pharisees. So we're not, but what Matthew 23 doesn't um, um, express to us is which Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. It says the Pharisaic movement sits in the seat of Moses. And then Yeshua funnels that down based upon Luke chapter 7 and other passages to his disciples, that which are the Pharisees that sit in the seat of Moses. We know from Luke chapter 7, I can't stress it enough. If you reject what God was doing at that time period, you will forfeit God's purpose for your life life i believe god had a purpose for the pharisees but then it goes on that he goes down to a specific group of pharisees and then with the gospel he gives authority to others i will stress this though uh, rabbi um i was gonna say rabbi david david costello brings down to us the <laughs> idea of positivity about the traditions of the pharisees but this is not the only position yeshua jesus himself says that the, because of the traditions of the pharisees they nullify the word of god what does that plainly mean? That means that the traditions of the Pharisees aren't the word of God because the word of God can't nullify the word of God. And this is important and we need to understand that. Okay. Thank you so much for that. All right. So we have another question by Hans Twilight. He says, uh, this question for you, David, is there any archaeological discovery concerning the oral law in the books of the law? So you're talking about an archaeological discovery of the oral law in the books of the law. I'm trying to understand exactly what you're trying to get at. I think, I think his question is probably um, whether or not do, do any of the manuscripts of the book of the law, any scrolls of the books of the law that we found or discovered, do they ever mention this oral law? Um, so I'm not up on what's been discovered archaeologically. Um, I can say that there are made mikvahs that have been discovered. So if you're looking at archaeological uh, understandings of how to make a mikvah, um, we, you can go to the Temple Mount and you can see um, mikvahs which obey the laws of, of mikvah even today um, at the Temple, uh, underneath the Temple Mount and around. We, we do have examples of mikvahs that are constructed according to oral law i'm not sure exactly how far those go back um i believe they're at least at the time of the temple what are mikvahs um, the, huh what are, what are mikvahs mikvahs are um ritual baptismals i guess you'd say yeah um so it doesn't collect, like so it doesn't um, like this it's not in the books of the law though it's not like, in the, like, books of the law their their, okay. their construction uh, specifics are not in the books of the law Okay. Um, this is this is this is rabbinic in origin. Okay. Um, uh, the specifics as out as to the how these are to be constructed. Um, and so, 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 we, so, we so do as far as archaeological evidence of um, of ritual immersion like mikvahs. Uh, so yeah. as as far as you know, as far as you know, there's no. Um, well, the, as far as you know, there's no mention in any of the the you know the scrolls of the books of the laws that we have. Um, that mentioned this oral law. Um, you're talking about as far as like the like we were talking about like the Dead Sea Scrolls kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. Um, not that I know of as far as it mentions oral law, but I do. Okay. But we do see it from archaeological evidence that the rules were applying. This is this is the same thing that I'm trying to make with the New Testament. We do see these rules being in play, and so therefore we have to understand that they existed. Um, the New Testament itself is a good proof that these things were going on at the time because of the types of discussions that were being had. All right. Radar apologetics. Uh, I'll just throw this out there. I don't remember exactly what the question is, but uh, there's there's no evidence that there was an oral Torah. Uh, all that's evidence, even by these mikvahs, is that people had traditions of washing ritualistically. The There is a jump and a presupposition. This is the oral law. And David made a mistake like he made many times throughout this debate. He anachronistically projects the rabbis back into the time of the Pharisees. So mm -hmm. we do have in the first century mikvahs, which were ritual baptismals, uh, where there were washings happening. The Essenes did it. But the Essenes, remember, are not part of the chain of transmission in the oral law. So they had some baptismals. They had things that they did. But when we look at the writings of all the Jewish groups around them, 
Everyone understands that the Pharisees had their traditions, which were the traditions of the elders, but there is no way that you can prove that this was the oral law that later becomes rabbinic. Tra- just because they're same doesn't mean the same thing. Just because you can find a correlation between them doesn't mean there's a one-to-one equation with the traditions of the fathers along with the oral law. Now, if you believe that the traditions of the fathers, the traditions of the elders, indeed is what becomes the oral law, then you cannot believe in Yeshua because Yeshua says your traditions nullify the word of God. It depends right. on can I answer that? Can I can I respond to that a little bit? Because I just feel like that was a little bit of a of a sort of a can you do it in 30 seconds? Important to the topic. Yeah. I, I'll try to do it in 30 seconds. Um hmm. the 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 issue is, is that I can trust the Jews that the reports of what the Tanim said that they're not going to make up the law that what the Tanim said at the time of the Jews. And so they're recorded as discussions of the time of the Jews. I trust that they would record them accurately for the sake of their own religion, as well as, as for the sake of, of, of Judaism and continuing the process and wanting to hold the truth. All right. So, so I trust that they, they were accurate in their description of the Tanim. All right. So um, got a question for Rabbi Eduardo uh, from Ken from Ken Ames, I believe. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, but he says, if you believe that Yeshua is the son of God and taught with the authority of God, then why do you directly disobey him by allowing yourself to hold the title of rabbi? Because I don't believe the Bible is the word of God. No, I'm just kidding. So the, the, the reason why I allow myself to be called rabbi is because the first time, and I'm glad this came up, in written documentation that any person is called a rabbi, it was John the Immerser. And you know what Yeshua said about John, who allowed himself to be called rabbi? In case Ken Ames doesn't read the Bible, um, it says that um, those are born among women. No one's greater than John the Immerser. And he allowed himself to be called rabbi. So Yeshua must not have been making a blanket ruling that you can't be called a rabbi. If you continue to read the passage in context, which is what I would recommend for Ken Ames, read the Bible in context. Read that passage in context. It was about hypocrisy, about making broad to fill in and making your seats long, your phylacteries. This was the passage. It wasn't about the usage of the title rabbi it was about hypocrisy which is very much related to matthew 23 all right uh david castell did you have anything you wanted to say to that or no i mean that sounded to... like a pretty good uh pretty good argument thanks man i got it i got it from you no, hey. <laughs> all right so the next the next question the next question we have from aspects of ashley um if the contents of the oral law is so important to understanding why wasn't it written down to avoid these type of disputes? I'm assuming that's to me. Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it was actually forbidden to be written down. Uh, the reason it was forbidden to be written down is because we want to continue with a continuity of the people. So the, the, if you have a book, it's very easy for you to lose a teacher. And it's incredibly important for you to have a teacher. And it's incredibly important for you to have someone to pass it down to you, to not do something on your own. I'm I'm accused of this all the time uh, because I I have some views that don't quite fit in with Jews and don't quite fit in with Christians. Um, But for me, you know, I have a rabbi that I go to and I respect and and, um, who answers a lot of questions for me. And so um, the not wanting to get away from a teacher is an incredibly bad idea because you get a lot from not just reading a book of what somebody said, but also following them around and seeing if their actions match up with what they wrote. And so the reason that you don't have the oral law written down is to encourage the continuation of going to a rabbi and appearing before a rabbi and attaching yourself to a rabbi and really living life as you were supposed to. So a disciple in that day would the hair would be the same. The the beard would be the same. The sitsis would be the same. Like you you followed your rabbi and everything that he did. Um, there's a there's a, a thing in the Talmud which is a, a written version of this. Is a, a Talmud literally f- followed people into the uh, of Rabbi um, Chania, followed him into the bathroom, followed him underneath his bed to sort of see what the rabbi did, how the rabbi lived, and I think that's really important for us as followers of Yeshua. Um, we should. Hey, see I think I remember that. I'm sorry, but what was what was he going to watch the rabbi do to learn from him? Um, go to the bath. There's bathroom. There's one that's about bathroom. There's one about intimacy with the wife, which goes to the whole talking to I mean, women. He was going to watch his rabbi have sex with his wife. No, he was going to listen to hear the conversation. He's going to listen to his. his... Yeah. 
rabbi have sex with his wife to learn how to be like him? The, the conversation, yeah. So the, that's this part is, of the oral Torah. This is part of the Talmud, yeah. So the yeah, the I, oral Torah. Yeah, the okay. idea is is that it, um, it is a devotion to the rabbi. Um, I don't think what you're probably going to say is isn't that kind of immoral and gross. Um, but the issue with, uh, with, with that I would say is, is that it's more to teach a lesson of to be committed to your rabbi and to follow your rabbi. Um, in, Does that make sense to you? Aspects. Does that make sense to you, David? To follow your rabbi in all aspects? No, of no. Do you, do, if you had a student, you would want him laying under your bed while you uh, make love to your honey bunny? No, I, um, that's my wife, not my honey buddy, but yeah. Uh, uh, my wife is my honey bunny, so I don't know. <laughs> I spice it up, brother. Uh, Look, what I'm saying is, would you want your student to sneak under your bed to listen to you, uh, be intimate with your wife? I would want that. I wouldn't want my actions. I'm going to say it this way. Cause I know what, I know what you're trying to get into. I would want asking. my actions to match up with what I teach. And so if my actions don't match up with what I teach, then I would want to have someone following me. I do have people following me around. But I would want people to follow me around to see how I behave, which is what the disciples did with Yeshua. They followed him everywhere. Um, so if you're just, I just have a question real quick. So if your student, uh, I'm sure you have students, said, look, Rabbi David, I believe the Jewish people have the oracles of God, that we have a Torah, we have an oral tradition. And here was a positive thing to sneak under the bed of my rabbi and listen to his wife. This is what I would want to do. What would you tell him? It, it is what I would not recommend. Would you tell him to do the oral Torah or not do it? I would tell him to do the oral Torah. And we have so you would tell him to go under your bed and listen to you be intimate with your wife? No, we have halakas for that now. So you yeah, would tell him to not do that? To I not follow the oral law? Follow, I would not tell him to follow me. I would give him the, the book. So you halakas. would tell him not to listen to you against the I, oral Torah? Or would you tell him to listen Torah. to the oral Torah? I don't know. I would tell would... him to listen to the oral Torah. And I give him so you would tell him to go under the bed and listen to you? No. Again, there are varying understand there are varying understand which is why it's not the word of god opinion there are many opinions this the halakhic positions i'm not saying it's a word of god rabbinic judaism itself says that Ram -Bam says it's the word of god though the risa and the rabbanon the mm -hmm. the the what you follow with the rabbis is clearly different from what is written to Raita. there this is, is a distinction that is made the Raita is from the torah written for itself the Rabbanon is from the rabbis. So you don't want him to follow there the oral is Torah. A, there is a def definitive difference between oral Torah and written Torah in mm -hmm. oral Torah itself. Was So according to Rambam, you said Rambam can establish halakhic belief, that he obligates you legally to believe something. He can do that. He says that the Gemara was given to Mount Sinai. You said in Talmud it's a positive thing to listen to your rabbi, be intimate with his wife, and now you're going to tell them not to do that. My friend, do you not see how inconsistent your worldview is that it crumbles before you? It does not crumble before me. You're misunderstanding. Can I get a one if his world you're, crumbles, you're crumbles before him in the comment section? Hopefully we get somebody who's an Orthodox Jew who can ask a good question to Rabbi uh, Eduardo about the how how the halakhic process works. Now right? I'm not there's, Rabbi Eduardo. You see that? <laughs> there's Shulchan Aruch. There's, there's Shulchan Aruch. There's Mishnah Berua. There's other halakhic words. Monte Ephraim. There's different halakhas for different communities. Are they Those more authoritative than Rambam? Huh? Are they more authoritative than Rambam? They're for different communities. Almost nobody follows the Rambam. It does not, uh, let me ask you a question. Does rabbinic Judaism... The Jewish community that follows the Rambam, the Mishnah Torah, from beginning to end right now, mm -hmm. is a Yemeni community, and they're, okay. they're quite small. Most okay. Ashkenazic Jews follow Mishra Rua. Um, Hungarian Jews follow Monte Ephraim, which is cool. sort of... Can I ask you a question Mishra really quick? What? Does the does the oral Torah state that there, no one has... There's never been a prophet in Israel like Moses until Moses referring to Rambam? Uh, I'm not sure if he says that or not. Not him. Has it been said of him? Possibly. I'm not, uh, but I don't know for 100%. So is there anyone greater in Orthodox Judaism than Rambam after the time of the uh, Nevi'im? It depends on who you talk to. It's not monolithic. There is it was before you, my it's brother. Crumbles. It's not crumbles monolithic. You. It is multiple. There are multiple halakhic distinctions. It is not you begin and end with the Rambam. There are other halakhic authorities. Yosef Ka Rabbi Yosef Karo, um, who wrote the Shulchan Aruch, is another one. It is incredibly unpopular and important with the Sephardic community. Crumbles, my brother. You Crumbles, can have a Yeshua follower that follows according to Yeshua. I've actually changed some of my... You menhaf. can have a Yeshua follower who follows according to Yeshua? 
Can we yes. wind that thing back? Okay. Uh, so there can be a Yeshua follower that doesn't follow Yeshua? Yeah. Crumbles, my brother. Crumbles, you man. Repent, brother. Yeshua Come follower. into the truth, brother. Come you into the have, truth. You can have a Yeshua follower who does not follow Yeshua. That is true. All right, I have a you question. Can have, uh, there's another <laughs> question here. That's uh, There's another question here by Henry. Um, how do you guys reconcile John 858? Henry. The, oh, okay. John 858. What's the... Yeah. Uh, before Abraham was, I am. How do you, how do you, because you, uh, you don't affirm the deity of Christ, do you? Uh, we said we were going to talk about this. I didn't say that. Oh, we did say, we said we we're going to stick to the debate, but yeah. do you not want to deal with that? If you, you don't I'll answer it. I'll it is, answer it. It is a little off, so you don't I'll have answer to. it. I just thought it was interesting. I'll answer it. Eight, Matthew 838, you said? John, John 858. 858. John Jesus. 8. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Oh, okay. I can answer that question. That doesn't have, yeah. I can answer that question. All right. Go ahead. Okay. But Rabbi, Rabbi Eduardo said he wanted to talk about it first. As succinctly as possible, guys, because this one is a little off the, the subject. So I, do, I did want to get a brief answer from you. So as Colossians says, and as other pastors of the New Testament says, he's the visible image of the invisible God. He makes God known. He makes the Father known. God is complex in his unity. When you see the Son, you see the Father because they are one being, but multiple persons. He is eternal, uh, not created, um, forever existed, Son of God who took on flesh at one point and gave himself on behalf of humanity, died, stood in the ground for three days, rose again, victorious, sits at the right hand of the Father. The Ego Ami is the Greek form of Ehiye Asher Ehiye. He is God himself. Anything else is heretical. David, please share your position. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, going, I am not a replacement theologian, uh, and I will not quote uh, those who propose replacement theology. Uh, my answer to 858 is it is Jewish tradition that the soul of Messiah was uh, uh, born and created before the foundation of the world, before the sun. So how do you recognize that? He was that? created? Messiah obviously precedes the creation of the world. So how, how do you reconcile John 858? Because the soul of Messiah was, was created before the foundation of the world. The soul of Messiah, which, what is that? Which is before Abraham. The soul, the soul of the Messiah. Oh, the so this, this is a midrash that the soul of Messiah, the name of Messiah, existed before the world created. So this is the idea that the Messiah was created at some point, which is not a proper belief or perspective, which I would love to debate David another time on, um, according to the New Testament. All right. So, so the soul of the Messiah existed before Abraham was born. Created before created. Abraham was born. Created before the before the world was born. Yeah. Okay. Don't hop in, Avery. Don't hop in, Avery. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, last question from John Scott, because I don't see any other questions here. Um, but I uh, just wanted to put this coming up here because this made me laugh when he was talking about <laughs> the, the rabbi thing. Uh, he says, how is this different from filthy Quran? <laughs> I, I, can I answer that? Can I answer that, though? Because I think there's, I think there's something that people have to understand, which is really important that God has chosen the Jewish people in many ways, and that even though the Jewish people are cut off from the Messiah and they remain by the wayside, they can still be grafted back on. I do believe that God has left crumbs of truth within the traditions of the house of Israel that point to the Messiah out of love for the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he wants the Jewish people to come back to him. So I believe that there have been seeds of truth left in there. So in many ways, it is different from Quran and the Hadith in the sense that as a people, the Muslims don't are not in covenant with the God of Israel, right? As individuals, they come into covenant with the God of Israel, but the Jewish people remain total in a covenant with the God of Israel, but they are cut off from the tree. And the root of the tree is the Abraham and covenant so they don't get that nourishment but it's very important that we understand even as you may be from the nations you may be part of a church understand that you don't boast against the natural branches because the natural branches can be grafted back on and you can be taken off for your boasting so there's something to understand there that's different because the covenants were given to the father so just try to try to try to get that but it is it is true that there are many things that have been added because of the flesh of men so yeah yeah all right um that's that's it for our our questions it looks like no one else has had any questions and we're at an hour and 30 something minutes so i think this is this was pretty good uh this was really fulfilling so 
I want to thank Radar Apologetics and David Costello for coming onto this channel, allowing me to host this discussion. It was a great discussion. I'm glad we did it here. I'm glad we got as many people in here engaged as, it, as, as they were. A lot of people were interested in this. So if you guys have any more ideas for the future and you guys want to host more discussions uh, like topics like these, please hit me up and we can do it anytime anywhere type of thing okay um any last words of where you know uh they can find you radar apologetics and david costello um where you guys do you know get your information out where they can support you patreons and things of this nature um yeah uh uh um, <laughs> there's a donation page there um and you can go to that you can look us up we also have a Chavis Hinnom on Facebook you can find us there Chavis Hinnom on Twitter but we don't really use Twitter too much but you can find us there um info at a is a place where you can email us if you want to have any follow-up questions and we can talk to you uh privately um there's a donation button on our Chavis Hinnom.com page I'm, I'm missing my wife she always reminds me of the things that I'm supposed to say when uh <laughs> talking about promotion of our, our thing. So you can find us on uh, on there and on YouTube as well. We do have uh, an Ahava Sinem YouTube page um, where we put out um, talks about the Parsha, um, how we um, resolve issues between uh, what's seemingly difficult things of oral law and the New Testament. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. And Radar Apologetics, where can we find you and support Ooh. your ministry? So my uh, channel is Radar Apologetics. I've got videos on there, other debates. I've done other discussions with the oral law. Uh, please go find me there. I'm on Clubhouse as well. If you go to Radar Apologetics on YouTube, everything's on there. You go to RabbiWater.com. You can find more info. I do serve as the associate rabbi. I am a pulpit rabbi of a synagogue in Bethlehem, PA. And I am also part of the IAMCS, the International Alliance of Messianic Congregations and Synagogues. So I'm not a cowboy. I do have other rabbis over me that watch my development and those sorts of things like that. So big shout, big respect to them. Um, and you guys keep me in prayer. And I do pray that the God of Israel is magnified in this, the God of Israel who is indeed Yeshua the Messiah. All right. And with that, you all, we're going to bring this to a close. Thank you so much for coming through. Uh, thank you all for hitting that like button and for subscribing. If you guys haven't subscribed already. And also, do not forget, uh, if you like this channel, to support this channel, God Logic Apologetics. I just released my Patreon last week. And uh, you can join up on my Patreon and uh, support the ministry so that we can go full time eventually. All right. So I want to thank God for everybody. God bless you all. And this is a wrap. Jesus is Lord. God is triune. Stay away from Islam. Alhamdulillah, Yeshua. All right. Amen. Amen. Baruch Yeshua. There you go. <laughs>